Hi, everybody. Welcome to our March Book Up at Home live author event. I'm Jordan Smith from the National Book Foundation, where we work year round to connect readers and books. And we do this in a few different ways. Um, one way is through the National Book Awards, where we work every year to identify and celebrate some of the best literature in America. We also do this through programs like Book Up, where we work with young people and connect you with books and have conversations about those books and really sort of dive into them together. In a typical year, Book Up is a program that happens at schools and community centers all across the country. This year, of course, living in a pandemic, Book Up is all happening uh, mostly from our homes and in a virtual format. And we're super excited that you are joining us today for our Book Up at Home presentation. Um, we're really excited to be able to use this platform to connect you with a lot of great authors we're doing this on sort of a monthly series. So perhaps you've tuned in before and will join us again. Um, and we're also excited that be because we're doing this virtually, we can open this up to any middle and high school student who's interested, even those outside of our um, Book Up Partner programs. Before we get started, a uh, very quick thanks both to our Book Up Partner staff and teachers who help connect students with these events, and also to our funders who help make this program possible, the National Endowment for the Arts, New York State Council on the Arts, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. So today, I'm really excited to welcome Kaysen Callender as our author. Kaysen was born and raised in St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands. They're the author of a number of books for young people, including Hurricane Child, Felix Ever After, and This is Kind of an Epic Love Story, and books for adults as well, including Queen of the Conquered and King of the Rising. Their most recent book for young people, King and the Dragonflies, was actually the winner of the 2020 National Book Award for Young People's Literature this year. So we're super proud to have the chance to celebrate uh, this book and Kaysen and their work. Um, so students who are part of our Book Up program have received a copy of King, of the, King and the Dragonflies. And if you're not part of our Book Up program, I hope you can still check it out from your library or your local bookstore. Aside from being a writer, our students might be interested to know and maybe have some questions later um, that in Kaysen's free time, they enjoy video games, anime, and reality TV shows. Kaysen, you and I might have to talk about bad reality TV because I am also a fan. Um, so today we'll hear from Kaysen um, and then we'll turn it over to questions from students. We've received some in advance, which is great, but we want you guys to keep those questions coming. Um, you can use the Q&A function that you see um, to submit questions today. So I'm going to turn it over to Kaysen. Take it away, Kaysen. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So I believe I have a presentation. If I could pop up on the screen. There we go. So as was said, I am the author of King and the Dragonflies. Um, next slide, please. And these are the books that were mentioned earlier, King and the Dragonflies and Hurricane Child are my two middle grade titles which are for the age ranges of about eight to 12. And my two YA teen titles are, this is kind of an epic love story and Felix Ever After. Um, and the two adult novels that were mentioned, Queen of the Conquered and the second, King of the Rising is not on this slide. Um, but as you can see, I like to write for all age ranges and for all genres. Next slide, please. So I really want to make sure that we're kind of all on the same page for my definitions when I speak about LGBTQIA plus and queer and these different terms. So um, for me, I just want to say that LGBTQIA plus stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, and asexual and aromantic. Um, and the plus would refer to other identities such as pansexuality. And for me, queer is an umbrella term. Historically, it was used uh, to harm people in our community, but the term was taken back and is now being used to empower. And many people prefer to use the term um, for their identity, including myself. Non-binary for me is also an umbrella term for people who don't identify with the idea of binary genders. And interestingly, there's more information now about how there really isn't actually a binary biological gender of male and female. Um, we're all on the spectrum biologically, so there isn't even really a binary anyway. And besides that, identity doesn't equal biology, and many people don't identify with the gender at all. So I like to identify, um, I identify as demiboy, which is a non-binary term, 
where I feel non-binary most of the time, but sometimes I also feel like a guy. So I use they, them pronouns, which are pronouns that a lot of non-binary people use. And a lot of people like to say they, them pronouns are grammatically incorrect, but we also use that in everyday life, such as when someone says, uh, oh, someone dropped their wallet. We say there because we don't really know what that person's gender is. And it's the same when you use someone's pronouns, are they, them. You can't assume what anyone's gender is just by looking at them. So next slide, please. Some random facts about me. Um, I'm a Virgo. I was born on September 19th, and I'm 31 years old. The first books I ever read as a kid were from the Animorph series. And when I'm not writing, I like was mentioned earlier, I like to draw, I like to play with my pet cat, Captain. I play RPG video games and games like Among Us. Um, I love watching Netflix and Hulu and practicing yoga and meditation and of course reading. Next slide, please. There's my pet, Captain. She's actually outside of my bedroom right now, desperately trying to get in. So I'll have to play with her afterwards. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm from St. Thomas of the US Virgin Islands. St. Thomas and the U.S. Virgin Islands are on the map, as you can see where that red dot is, right next to Puerto Rico. Uh, next slide. And zooming in, the one that says Charlotte and Molly is uh, St. Thomas. So that's where I grew up, and that's where I was born and raised until I was 18, and I went to uh, New York for college. Next slide, please. When I was younger, I was super into filmmaking. So I, would, uh, I was a part of a filmmaking summer camp and I was always into storytelling, all forms of storytelling. Um, while I was trying to do, while I was, while I was making movies during the summertime, I would also be writing fan fiction, for example. Um, next slide, please. And as I mentioned, I went to New York when I was uh, in college, and that was my first time seeing snow when I was about 17 or 18 years old. So in this photo, that's just me playing in snow for the first time and super excited, but. I have to say I'm not a fan of snow anymore. So next slide, please. I was also very into um, Japan and studied Japanese. So these are two pictures of me when I studied abroad, one in high school and one in college. Uh, next slide, please. So that was just a little bit about me. Um, I would also like to say from when I was younger, I also struggled a lot when I was growing up. I had a lot of trauma that I needed to heal. And I was often bullied and isolated, and I really escaped my world through writing and reading. So that was really my entire life. So it makes sense now that I would grow into being an author. And what's it like being an author? So this is actually an old slide. I used to show this to, um, to classrooms. I used to have a very strict schedule. I do not have a strict schedule anymore. And I think that's important to say because there's so much pressure to um, pretend like life is normal these days. It really isn't. The world has changed so much. So I don't stick to a schedule anymore during the, in the pandemic in these, in these times. Um, I do what feels right and I, what feels good to my body and my mind and what I need at that time. Um, next slide, please. So I do have a lot of tasks that I have to um, stay on top of still that are not just uh, writing, such as signing book plates, which are kind of like these stickers, I guess, that can be sent to authors to put into books and to sign so that we um, can put our signatures inside of books and also speaking at events such as this. Next slide, please. But uh, for me, it is mostly writing. I juggle multiple projects at once. Right now I'm working on many, many projects. Um, I, yeah, I'm working on about like five projects right now. And that's a part of my process. And that's because I'm, I have ADHD and I'm very open about that. Um, it's a lot easier for me to jump from one project to the next whenever I feel like I have writer's block or I'm stuck or I'm, you know, I just need some time and space from one book. It's very helpful to go to another book. And I do think that's a big part of my ADHD, but I also think it's why I'm able to write so many books so quickly and to be able to, um, be passionate about so many different genres and age ranges all at once. So next slide, please. I get my ideas from many places. Um, I get ideas from listening to music. Uh, when I listen to songs, a lot of the time, it's almost like a music video begins to play in my head and I meet characters and I see cool settings and it's like watching situations and scenarios play out without really hearing any dialogue yet. So the fun part about the writing is then 
sitting down and actually putting um, dialogue to those themes I saw play out in my head. Next slide, please. I also journal a lot. Um, earlier, I mentioned that I had a lot of traumas that I had to heal from when I was younger. Um, and basically, I think that every single person's life is a book. That's how I think of it. And in a book, characters also have their specific traumas that have hurt them and create um, their viewpoint of the world. So for example, when I was younger, I learned not to think that I'm safe with other people because I expected other people to bully me. So growing up, I and as I became an adult, I really had to learn to feel safe with the world around me, regardless of whether other people will bully me or not. And another big part of that was uh, thinking that I'm not worthy of love, for example, because I'm being attacked by other people who say that I'm not worthy of love. So I also had to learn how to love myself, no matter what other people think. So writing about different traumas I've survived really gives me ideas for my characters, because all of my characters, for every single book, are pieces of me and different traumas I've overcome. So you might have already read it, but King and the Dragonflies is about 12-year-old King, whose brother Khalid has passed away. And King thinks that Khalid has become a dragonfly and searches for his brother. But his former best friend, Sandy Sanders, has also gone missing, and King needs to find Sandy and heal their friendship. Um, King's life is very different from mine. Nothing that's happened in the book has actually happened to me. But King's trauma is what he needs to heal. And that is also my own trauma. King hides himself away because he's afraid that he won't be accepted for who he is. Um, and you know, I want to make it very clear that I'm not talking about sexuality. I actually think that, um, you know, for example, in the book, King realizes that he's gay, and he also realizes that he doesn't have to tell anyone if he doesn't feel safe with them. Um, I think that it's important to say that it's other people's responsibilities to make themselves safe before we invite them in and tell them what our identities are. I don't have to tell anyone that I'm trans or that I'm queer unless I feel that they are a safe enough person that's not going to harm me in any way. Um, and even then, even if I've decided they're safe enough, it's still my decision whether I'm going to tell them or not. It's not, um, a resp it's not my responsibility, it's not a requirement. And I feel it's important to say that. And that's a realization that King comes to the book in, in the book as well. Um, but I was similar to King in the sense that I stifled my voice, and I still often do. And I suppress what I really think and really feel because I'm scared of what other people think and how other people re will react to me. So that's an important um, trauma that I decided to heal through the book, through writing. I feel like oh, you might hear authors say this a lot, but writing for us is a lot like therapy because we get to look at our own issues in our own lives, our own traumas, and discover how the characters are healing from it and in a way heal ourselves too. And hopefully our readers get to heal with us. So um, next slide, please. I also get a lot of ideas from, of course, watching TV, reading books. Um, I think at this point I will talk about some of the favorite books I would like to recommend. I'm not sure if that was going to be one of the questions asked later, but it just feels like a good place um, and time. So I would like to recommend a few books that are some of my favorites that have definitely been influences in how I write. The first would be The Best at It. Um, this one is about, let me see if I can get it into the screen. Yeah, there we go. I really love this book a lot. This is about a young boy, um, Rahul, who decides that he wants to be the best at something. Um, and then in the end, it sounds corny to say, but I really, I really do love this theme. In the end, he decides, um, he realizes that the best he can do is being himself. And I think that that's an incredibly, incredibly important lesson. Um, and it's also queer. So it's, you know, I feel like right now, especially, there's so many more queer middle grade books, which is fantastic because I never had anything like that when I was younger. And this particular book um, has a really wonderful and funny voice also. So I loved it a lot. This one made me cry. Um, the Prince and the Dressmaker, this is a graphic novel. And I think it's technically a YA, um, but I feel like middle grade authors or middle grade readers can enjoy it also. Um, this just really was an incredibly beautiful story about a prince who hires a dressmaker. 
Um, and I think that uh, because he would like to wear ball gowns and he wants to wear more feminine clothing. Um, and I think it's about radical acceptance of not only himself, but of the loved ones around him finally um, really accept, learning to accept who he is. It was just so beautiful. There's this really spectacular scene towards the end that made me just ball like a baby. Um, and then the final person, I'm going to I'm going to cheat. I was only supposed to recommend three books, but I really love Ashley Herring Blake. Um, this is her first novel, Ivy Aberdeen's Letter to the World, which is also another middle grade um, queer story about a young girl who is discovering her identity for the first time um, in the wake of a tornado that has ripped through town and ripped apart um, her town and her family. And then Ashley's second book is um, The Mighty Heart of Sunny St. James, which is also another queer story where a young girl has just had a heart transplant and she meets her long lost mother and is also um, discovering her feelings for a new best friend that might actually be more of a crush. So Ashley is just a really, really beautiful writer. I think that I will end there and I would love to take any questions. Great, thank you so much, Kaysen. Um, and just a reminder to the students who are watching, we're getting some questions in, but we definitely have time for more. So use that Q&A function and send them our way. Um, but I'll get started with a few questions that are about King and the Dragonflies specifically. Um, and I love this question from Zoe, which is why choose a dragonfly as the animal to focus on in this book? I love that question. Um, and it's funny because when I sat down to write, I did not think specifically of a reason why it had to be a dragonfly. The dragonfly really just came to me and writing the book itself felt very uh, dreamlike. And I don't know if anyone is into dreams or the study of dreams, but when I was younger, I um, was obsessed with symbology of dreams. Whenever you have a dream, everything in the dream is supposed to mean something. So. I don't know, um, I can't think of anything specifically, but like the color blue could mean in real life you're sadder than you expect, than you actually thought. So um, King and the Dragonflies, the writing of it felt like a dream. And then towards the end, I suddenly also asked myself, like, why would I choose a dragonfly that's very random? And the King himself even asked, like, why not a panther or a wolf? Um, and so I kind of like sat there and I looked up the symbology of dragonflies and it ties back to in dreams, um, dragonflies are actually supposed to mean like rebirth and transformation and are very closely connected to um, to death actually. And so it was kind of funny that just knowing that I'm so into dreams and symbols that the dragonfly ended up being the perfect symbol for Khalid and the story. And um, yeah, it felt like a dream writing it. So I guess it's fitting. Great. And I guess as a follow up to that question, um, Fatima wants to know, how do you come up with the titles for your books? Ooh, that's very hard to do. That's a very, very hard. And all the titles also end up changing quite a lot. So for King and the Dragonflies, it was originally King of the Dragonflies. And I think that that one came to me a lot easier than usual. But, um, you know, publishing companies really have a big say in what the title is going to be for the marketing of the books. So they were nervous that that one would sound a little too similar to Lord of the Flies. So they wanted to change of to and, and it might sound like a very small little thing, but it's um, just a good example of how easily titles can change. So I think that um, usually I sit down with the story and I collect all of the words that sound pretty or are good symbols of the story itself. And I try to mix and match and publishers really uh, help a lot with that too. That's so interesting to know that it was just one word change, but it really does kind of shift the, the feeling of it. Yeah. Um, some students from our book up group uh, to get back to King and the Dragonflies about specifically, how did you settle on the setting of the Louisiana Bayou? Yes, I wanted to write um, a story that reminded me very much of my own life in St. Thomas. And it's similar, Louisiana and the Bayou is very similar to um, Caribbean, the Caribbean in terms of like humidity and the feeling and the atmosphere of it. And I also wanted to write about Mardi Gras, which is similar to Carnival, which is something that we have in the Caribbean. Um, they're very closely related. And so, and I also wanted to write 
about a setting that is connected to hurricanes. At that time, um, the Virgin Islands had also just gone through Hurricane Irma and Maria. So I wanted to still be able to write about hurricanes in a loose way without um, being too connected to Hurricane Child, which was my first book. So I, I all those pieces together felt like Louisiana and the bayou were the perfect uh, setting for the story. Great. We also have some questions about sort of being a writer more generally. Um, and I like this one from Avion. Let's just get to the point. Do you like writing books? And is it fun? <laughs> <laughs> I do. It's a complicated. OK, so yes, I do love writing books, period. It can be very complicated, though, because um, it was once my hobby, and now it's my work. So when you're doing your hobby, you can do that whenever you like. But now that it's my job, sometimes it can be like, I'm not necessarily in the mood to write right now, but I have to. So th those moments do exist also. But to, to keep it just as straight to the point as possible, yes, I love writing. All right, I'm going to ask a, a multi-part question here. Because okay. a few students have asked, how many books have you written? Um, and then we've also got a question what is your favorite book that you've written? And similarly, what is the most difficult book that you've written? Maybe the answer is the same to both, but <laughs> I'd love to hear favorites, biggest challenge, and how that sort of fits into your work overall. Um, that's a good question. Uh, for the how many books have I written, I guess at that point, like six books have come out. But uh, behind the scenes, there are books that have not been announced yet or not have been published just yet. So. I think nine books. Um, so three books that I'm writing right now. Yes, that makes sense. Three books I'm writing right now separately. No, 10. I knew I was forgetting one. Um, four books I've written separately that haven't come out yet. And to answer the question of which one has been the hardest, it would definitely be one of the books I'm writing right now um, and has been, you know, I guess I can't really speak to it too much because it hasn't been announced or it hasn't come out yet. But of the books that were the hardest to write that have come out, um, hmm. This is going to sound like I wish I could say, I guess it would be the adult book because uh, the deadline was actually very, uh, it was maybe like three months. Like I had to write it very, very quickly. So I think that that was the hardest for that reason. Yeah, it's so interesting that you've written for so many different age groups. And um, another question we have is, do you think about yourself when you're writing or your readers or maybe somebody else? Who, who are you sort of imagining when you're in the writing process? It's a mix of both. I imagine the younger me um, when I was about 12 years old and I really needed these specific books. And I'm also thinking about um, readers that I've met in classrooms where we've had really great conversations. When I was writing King and the Dragonflies, I was thinking back to um, New York City classrooms where I had gone to speak with young readers. And we had such great conversations um, about like queerness and race and how it can intersect. And I really wanted to write a book that also um, talked about these issues. So when I was writing King and the Dragonflies, like those conversations that King and Sandy have about what it, what are the differences between being white and being um, black and queer and poor, like all these intersectional identities, how, how do they um, affect how we react to each other? I really wrote those scenes with a lot of different young readers in mind that I'd met from classrooms where I knew that they would really enjoy having those conversations as well. Great. Um, you touched on this a little bit in your presentation, but um, Elizabeth and Qualion are asking, what inspired you to start writing? Maybe what inspired you to sort of make that commitment to it being your full-time work? Yeah, uh, definitely. You know, I loved writing when I was younger. Like I mentioned, um, it was more of a hobby where I was writing fan fiction for anime and for some of my favorite books. And then I think when I, when I got to maybe college age, I discovered or I realized that a lot of the mainstream, most popular books really did not feature people that looked like me. I wasn't seen, even back then, I really wasn't seeing any black characters and let alone black and queer characters and let alone black and queer and trans characters. So I think that that was my um, main motivation at that time to really see more published stories that looked like people that featured people that looked like me. 
And it has since then, like the the industry has changed so drastically so quickly, and it's really been uh, miraculous to see. And I'm really grateful for how many more stories are out there featuring people that look like us. Great. Um, a question from Elizabeth is, what advice would you give to a new writer? So much advice. I think a lot of people <laughs> say <hear> to read. <laughs> I think a lot of people say to read um, a lot, and I agree with that. And to, you know, take it a step further, you know, I think um, perseverance. When I was younger, I would, I, there's always like one book I think about when I was younger, that I, the first novel I ever attempted to write that taught me so many different lessons because it was a book that I never was able really to finish writing for years like I would always get to the halfway mark and um, I would give up and I would start to rewrite it again and then get to the halfway mark and give up and I did that for years and I to this day have maybe like a hundred plus different drafts of this one book so I think really forcing if I had forced myself to just get to the end I would have learned so much more about the process of writing and then it would have been easier to um, to just kind of like figure out how to actually write a book the next time I tried. And then I also wish that I had put that idea to the side instead of being um, so stuck on the idea that it has to be this one book. So I could have realized, okay, it's not working and put it to the side and then started another idea, having learned what I needed to learn from the first book and gotten to the end. And I feel like my writing, like learning how to write all of that would have happened for me um, much more quickly. So I guess my advice would be persevere and try to get to the end of the book that you're writing. And then also, if it's just not working, it's okay to put it to the side and move on to the next idea instead of being stuck with the first idea for like five, 10 years. That was actually a perfect segue. I think you answered my next question um, mm -hmm. from a young writer who says that they have been working on a lot of stories, but only finished a few. And so knowing that um, that's okay, that sometimes moving on to the next thing is the best thing you can do as you're sort of developing your strengths as a writer. Um, they also ask, can I publish books now as a young person or do you have to wait until you're an adult? You could definitely publish now as a young person. Um, yeah, this isn't what the question was, but I think you just need to, I mean, there's just like a lot of the process where you have to find like a literary agent, someone who would represent you. Um, and if you're a young person, definitely have like an adult in your life that you trust who would be able to help you through the process because there's just so much like, you know, publishing lingo that even as an adult, I get confused and like just want to make sure that there's someone um, on your side that's really there to guide you. So you would, so the process would be finding a literary agent first who's able to represent you and then they sell your book to the publishing company. Um, and there's so much great information online about that. If you Google how to query literary agents, a lot would come up. And I think it's so cool now that there are all these um, you know, platforms outside of, you know, the traditional way that you might publish a book that you can still share your work. Maybe your school has like a literary magazine or creative writing club or something like that. And I think those can be great first steps too, that, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, on a bookshelf in these days, especially with things online in order to, to get out to other readers and get feedback and, and all that sort of good stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe this is an unfair question from Casper, given the audience that we have of young people today, but do you like writing for adults or for young people better? Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's hard to answer because I like both for different reasons. Um, and I think that writing for young people for me is just really healing of like the different uh, stories that I really needed from when I was younger. So I feel like that's kind of filling a hole that even as an adult, I still need to um, to fill by writing those stories. Um, yeah, I think I'll end it there. I was going to say why I like writing for adults, but I don't think it matters in this case. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? Um, yeah. 
This is a great question from Madam. Um, if you could change one thing that happened in your book, I think maybe she's asking about um, King and the Dragonflies, but any book, I guess. Um, is there anything you would change looking back now that it's complete um, in any of the, the work that you've published? Hmm. Definitely in um, some books, I'm sure there are like little things I can think of now where it's like as soon as the book came out, there were struggles I had been, um, you know, I was trying to like figure out like how to tell the story in the way I wanted to tell it. And I couldn't figure it out as I was writing it. And for Epic Love Story, for example, the day that that book published, I was uh, came out, I was like, oh, that's the answer. I wish I'd figured that out two years ago. Um, so that's definitely happened. For King and the Dragonflies, though, no. Um, I think the one and only thing is that I feel like I was a little too ambiguous with the idea that um, it's okay to, or I, I feel like I was maybe a little too ambiguous with the idea that you can feel safe with someone before inviting them in. And I did say that in the book, but I wish I had said it even more strongly in the way that I do now whenever I'm speaking to people. Like, I feel like I was almost a little too subtle in the book. And now I kind of wish I had said it very straight out in the novel itself. You do not have to come out, period, if you don't want to. Yeah, that's a great follow-up. Um, we also have some questions about your life outside of being a writer. So you talked about some of the things that influence you, music and TV and, and other books. Um, Fatima is asking, what do you have a favorite genre of books um, or movies in general? No, I really don't. I love everything. Um, and that can sometimes from the outside seem, maybe it's my ADHD, just seem like very random because I love contemporary, I love romance, I love fantasy, sci-fi. I think as long as it, there's a good story where I really feel connected to the character, it doesn't matter what the genre is. Cool. Um, I think this idea of um, unfinished work is very intriguing to some of our book up students. And Casper is asking if you're ever going to finish some of those unfinished stories that you wrote when you were younger. I've kept all of them. I do think about some of them sometimes. Um, and another fun thing has been with the unfinished stories is that sometimes I don't realize, um, you know, sometimes there's something that isn't working and I need five years of distance to figure out what wasn't working. And then another fun thing is that sometimes the ideas mesh together perfectly in the way that helps them work. So keeping all the ideas kind of like in my folder saying, I'll come back to them later is um, perfect. Is Sometimes I just need like the perfect one last ingredient that I didn't realize I needed three years ago to say, oh, that's the perfect thing that those two other stories needed. And if I mesh all these ideas together, it's the novel that I wanted to write, but I couldn't figure out how to. So. Anyway, yeah, I like to try to keep all the stories because I never know when they're going to come, um, when they're going to be useful. Yeah, that's great. Sometimes you can, you know, rediscover something, I think, that um, sparks a new idea. Um, and then thinking back to yourself as a young person, um, did you like to read growing up? What kind of things did you read? And um, this is not a question from a student. This is a question I always like to ask. But were there any adults that um, sort of encouraged you as a reader and a writer as well? Um, I don't think I needed that much encouragement as a reader because I was reading quite a lot, but I was reading fan fiction. I wasn't reading um, published novels. And I think that that's because I wasn't really seeing myself in those published novels just yet. I really loved Animorphs, for example. Um, but when it came to like fan fiction, that was the only place I was finding openly queer characters. So um, I was reading that quite a lot. I was reading... Um, I mean, I was writing on my own as well, and I was getting a lot of feedback from uh, people who would leave reviews saying that these stories were great. So that's how I was getting um, the support I kind of needed to continue writing too. Yeah, for folks who might not be familiar, um, can you explain a little bit like what fan fiction is and how, how that works? Sure, so um, I was super into anime, like I mentioned. So this is like the millennial, um, fan fiction period was Toonami. So that was like the after school Toonami would be playing Sailor Moon, Cardcaptor Sakura, Dragon Ball Z. And I would, um, Cardcaptor Sakura was my favorite. So basically it's like I take the characters and, you know, fan fiction in general is when you take the characters from your favorite uh, stories and you write 
like different storylines almost. It can be connected to that story or it can be connected or it can be a completely different world where you've just taken the characters and put it into your own scenario and your own novel. Um, and yeah, it was just a lot of fun. Yeah, I think it's such an interesting experiment for a writer or an aspiring writer because you're sort of starting with the characters and the, the world and then you're filling in um, your own details rather than it can be intimidating, I think, to start with a blank page and be like, how do I generate an idea from here? Right. Um, but speaking of ideas, another question is, what if you have too many ideas for a story? How do you sort of balance multiple projects and then like narrow in on, um, you know, the direction you're going to ultimately take? I love this question because that is what I struggled with the most, for sure. Um, again, the ADHD means having like 200 ideas, literally all at once and being so excited to write all of them all at once. Um, and one thing that I found that really has helped me is called the compost heap. And that is um, a term coined by Neil Gaiman. I was watching his masterclass. And basically, it's a document where you throw all of your ideas into this compost heap, right? Um, and that was helpful for me because, again, I would have like 200 different documents with a single sentence saying pirates, spaceships, aliens. It's like it's hard to remember what all the ideas even were. So putting them all into one single document lets me um, weave different connections. Remember, I was talking about those connections earlier. It helps me see connections I might not have seen if they were all in these separate documents. So then um, that helps me organize myself a lot more also. And then so when the ideas, when there are like 200 different ideas and then I start to see how they can connect, they start to narrow and narrow and narrow until I have like 50 ideas, for example. Um, and then when I have 50 ideas, I can easily say, you know, I'm not as excited about this one. Let me focus on this one instead. Um, so the compost heap was like the life changer, the life, the game changer for me when it came to having too many ideas and how to organize all of them. Um, and I think when it comes to figuring out which direction to go in, a lot of times it, for me, it comes to space and time, just giving space from the ideas, having time away from the ideas, um, focusing on you know, since I am writing so many different projects, it is easy to just say, I'm just going to focus on this project for a while. Um, and then months can pass. And if I had five different ideas that I wasn't sure what to work on next, more often than not, one is going to rise to the top as the one that I can't stop thinking about. And the others are more like, oh yeah, that was a good idea, but this one is the one that still has me like really excited. Whereas the other ones are things I think I could eventually return to, but I just can't, I, it's not something I have to do right now. I love that idea of a compost heap, especially because compost is, it's not like the garbage pile, right? You're not getting rid of it, but you're like <laughs> making something new out of it. Um, a question from Natalie is, do you have other tips in addition to the sort of compost heap approach for students and writers um, with ADHD? Hmm. You know, I think that, um, it was only really, I mean, I was diagnosed as a kid as having ADHD, but it, I never really thought about how it affects me as an adult until recently. There's been so much more conversation now, um, I think, about neurodivergency, um, at least from my view, like on TikTok and Twitter, there's just a lot more conversation happening. So that's been helping me figure out, oh, that's why I process things. That's why my process is different. And that's why I think I um, write a bit differently also than neurotypical people might when it comes to like expressing emotion, for example, that's something that um, not all neurodivergent people struggle with, but I do. So expressing emotion, if I'm having a hard time telling people how I feel in real life, that means that I'm gonna have a hard time having characters on the page express their emotion too, right? Um, so I think that just having an awareness of how for me, this has been helpful is just like having more awareness for how my neurodivergency affects me as a person, how that translates to the page and just having that awareness allows, um, allows me to continue to grow as a writer. Like if I'm struggling to have the characters express their emotion, then that's a, just having that awareness would allow me to work on it a little bit more, if that makes sense. 
Yeah. I love that we're getting so many questions about like process and techniques and things like that. And then um, a question I feel like we get a lot and uh, Qualion asked again to you is how long does it take you to write a, a novel? I think every writer has their own approach to this. <laughs> Yeah, it can be anywhere. I think the shortest book I wrote, like I like I said before, was The Adult. That was about three months. Um, and the longest was <laughs> that book I mentioned before also, where I still, um, it's probably never going to see the light of day, but it, I, I was writing it for about 10 years. So it really can um, change from book to book. And with that, I'll also say that I think the process can also change from book to book. I don't think that there's a single right process for writing a book period and even for individual writers i think that we sometimes get caught up in thinking we have to write a book this way because that's how i wrote books before but for me it changes sometimes i really need to write an outline and sometimes i need to um pants is what it's called right just writing by the seat of the pants i think is where the the allegory came from where you're just kind of like writing without really knowing what's going to happen next um so yeah, I think that the process can really change from book to book. And with that, the timing, like right now, I think my books are maybe taking like five months average to write, but I'm sure there will be a book that's going to take me five years to write someday. Cool. I think a lot of our book up students are, you know, they'll be in high school in the next few years. They're thinking about, they're starting to get those questions of what do you want to be when you grow up, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so if you hadn't ended up as a writer, what do you think you would have liked to do? Illustrator. For or can sure. you not imagine anything else? <laughs> no, I would have been an illustrator. Um, Cause I, when I was younger, I was also illustrating while I was writing and to this day, I really wish I hadn't stopped. I, I think I would have probably gone into creating graphic novels and I'm working on the script for a graphic novel right now. And I'm starting to go back into learning illustration and art again. So maybe one day I'll be able to, to create those graphic novels myself, but I would have been doing art for sure. Cool. Um, and I love some of these questions we're getting to. Uh, Zeneb asks, when you sort of just about doubting and, and questioning, um, you know, being a writer. Um, so when you first started writing and your first book was published, did you worry that it wasn't going to be successful? Hmm. Um, you know, I don't think I was so wrapped up in the different books I was writing after that, that I really did not even take a moment to celebrate the fact that my first book was published. I was already working, um, I think by that time, like on my third book. And I'm grateful for that because I think that the, the being worried about how the first book was received or not received well would have affected my writing following that. And I would have been too afraid of what people thought to really let myself just write freely, so. Are there any techniques or tricks you found helpful when you're facing doubts or, you know, questioning, is this going to work out? Is this going to be good? I think that a lot of that has to do with, um, for me anyway, it's had to do a lot with healing of caring about what other people think, like that need for validation. Um, I think a lot, I, I was definitely raised to be a perfectionist where it feels like if I'm not the best, then I'm not worthy of love. And it's taken me realizing that I'm worthy of love regardless of whether I'm the best writer. And even if I'm like the worst writer in the world, I'm still worthy of love. So that has helped me realize that regardless of whether the book is received well or not, and if I'm worried or have I have fear, like having, like remembering I'm worthy of love allows me to kind of like take away from that worry and fear. It doesn't really matter what people are going to say and think, whether they like it or not, either way, I'm still worthy of that love. Great. And along those lines, thinking about sort of feedback and recognition, um, Casper asked, um, how does receiving an award um, make you feel about your book? Does that change your relationship to it, uh, make you feel more accomplished? Um, and then specifically, what was it like to win the National Book Award? Winning the National Book Award was the shock of my life. I was not expecting that at all. You got to um, be part of our first virtual award, so it was an extra... Yeah special experience for everybody, I think. It was, yeah. And it was nice to, um, well, anyway, yeah, it was definitely life-changing. I think that 
I think similarly, though, like, I, you know, I'm beyond grateful because awards really allow for more um, eyes, I guess you could say, on the books. Like, I don't think King of the Dragonflies would have necessarily gotten the amount of attention if it hadn't won this award. And so um, for an author, that's a huge deal because that means more book sales and that means I get to write more books. So um, that in itself was extremely life changing. In terms of it changing how I feel about my own writing or, um, you know, kind of like feeling like it's an accomplishment, I do think it is important to celebrate. I also think I'm still kind of grasp grappling with the earlier concept I was just talking about, where regardless of whether it's um, viewed as an accomplished book or not, or whether it's not well received, it's like me as a writer, I'm still validated as a writer and I'm still um, worthy of love regardless. So I think that that's kind of where I am, where I'm trying to stay in a grounded space, I guess you could say, where it's like, you know, regardless of what other people say and think, I'm still worthy of love. Yeah. And I love what you said about awards being a chance to just help get more eyes on a book. Because I think that's something I find myself saying a lot to the young people in our programs that with something like the National Book Award, it's this super exciting moment for an author to be recognized that way. But for us as readers, it's also really exciting because it's a chance to maybe learn about a book we weren't aware of or connect with an author we weren't aware of and and sort of be part of that celebration too. So I, I, I really like that sort of perspective on it. Um, oh, this is a great question to go back to your um, sharing about your interest in art and illustrating. What is the process for designing a book cover? Like how does the art for it get created? And I think a lot of our students wanna know, do you have a say in that or does it yeah, happen separately? Um... So it depends on the publisher. Um, Scholastic for King and the Dragonflies and for Hurricane Child were very unique in that they didn't really reach out to me about the covers first. They kind of said, here's the cover. And both times I started to cry because I was like, this is perfect. It's not anything that I could have imagined. Um, so I really lucked out with that. But other covers, usually the publisher will reach out and say, so what do you think the direction should be? How, what do you want the cover to look like? Um, and it can be a bit of a back and forth as I think for Felix Ever After, for example, I uh, approved the illustrator beforehand. Um, and then they kind of like continue to check in and say, is this the what is this the direction that you would like? So again, it can change from book to book. Yeah, we always hear we're not supposed to judge a book by its cover, but I do think cover design gives us a lot of information or attracts us to a book or makes us pick it up or not pick it up. So it is a really interesting process to think about. Exactly, um, yeah. Would you ever want any of your books to be turned into a movie? And if you could choose which one would be your sort of dream adaptation? Yeah, Felix Ever After is going to be a TV show with Amazon Studios. So I'm super excited about that. Um, and hopefully there will be other news for other books someday, but I don't know for sure. Um, I think that's all I'm allowed to say at this point, honestly. <laughs> I know sometimes these things are in process and we can't quite talk about them, but that's great. That's something students can keep an eye out for. Um, mm. We definitely have some anime fans in our group. So are there any specific, uh, what anime would you recommend is a question we've got. Uh, I'm old school. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm old. Like, I know that you are probably watching. You're probably more on top of the anime that's coming out now. But um, I've been watching Jujutsu. Uh, is it Kaisen or Kaiden? Now I think I've gotten it wrong. But it's the one with, like, the guy with the pink hair. And he has, like, two eyes right here. And there's, like, a demon inside of him. Um, I love that show a lot. I, just, like, the tension of this demon, whether he's going to take over the guy's body, the main character's body or not is uh, super exciting. But I think because I'm probably more on like the old school side of things, Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood is definitely my favorite anime of all time. Um, and then going even further back, like animes like Cowboy Bebop, I think really just paved the way for everything that's coming out right now. So yeah. I, mean, I love that also you mentioned um, you know, being interested in sort of graphic novels earlier, because I think a lot of students uh, come to book up with an interest in anime and might, you know, more immediately connect with a graphic novel. So I think there's a lot of great work out there. And I think one of the books you recommended was a, yeah. was a graphic novel. So um, great. 
And while we're on extracurricular activity subjects, you, you talked earlier a bit about, um, you know, now living in a pandemic, not being a time of maybe being our most productive and making sure we take time to just sort of do what feels good and restorative and centering. Um, what are some things that you've found yourself drawn to, to doing during, during the pandemic? TikTok, honestly, so much TikTok. <laughs> <It's> totally fair. <laughs> um, yeah, TikTok, a lot of gaming. I have, you know, I used to play games pretty regularly and now it's become um, something that has been so supportive to my mental health. And I didn't even realize that gaming um, is actually like studies have been done really like supports mental health. So whenever someone tries to complain to you that you're playing too many games, you can hit them back with that statistic that it actually is helpful for mental health. Um, and besides that, again, like a lot of reading and I've been trying to, to get back into art as well. I think no matter what form of media young people are engaging in, adults like to say like, this will be damaging in such and such way. But um, yeah. one of our authors who visited us a few months ago, Tracy Chi, talked about how, uh, how much video games influenced her as a writer and thinking about the world of video games and the characters within those worlds and her path not taken, she said, was being a game designer, that if she hadn't, oh, um, yeah, that if she hadn't been a writer, she would have wanted to be a game designer. So there's definitely these these outlets for for creativity and i think maybe older folks who aren't engaging with them just don't see all of those elements of it yeah exactly um so when you were a young person and you first started writing was there someone who you felt was sort of your biggest supporter or your biggest cheerleader my mom she was definitely always um there to say just continue continue, continue, continue trying. And then also um, I would always like talk to her, ramble to her for hours on end about these different book ideas that I was struggling with. So the fact that she was the person that was always listening was super um, helpful to me for sure. And what was the experience like for you growing up in St. Thomas and then was moving to New York for college your first um, sort of like big move that, that you encountered? Yeah, it was. It was hard because St. Thomas is such a small place. Um, it's basically, think of like the smallest town possible, but also surrounded by ocean. So kind of like claustrophobic as well. I remember thinking, I'm just kind of like trapped here. Even if I wanted to run away, I can't go anywhere. Um, so moving from that to New York, which is such a big city, but I was in kind of like the suburb area around it. So I wasn't in the city exactly. But even that, just like leaving my extremely like small protective um, island where everyone knew everyone to this new place was just a huge culture shock. Great. And do you, um, are there family members or close friends that you share your books with before they're out there to the public? Do you have like a, a group that you trust to give you feedback in your first pass? Only my mom, again, she's to this day, she's still the supportive one I, I share my stories with, so. That's great. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Usually I ask for recommendations at the end, but you already gave us yours. So we are set with that. Um, just to sort of close us off, can you talk a little bit about, we have a question about um, research. And I kind of like this question because I think sometimes when we're in school and we are doing sort of like research projects, it feels like, what's the point of this? So do you do research for your books? And if so, how much and how does it influence it? Or do you maybe start with your story and then fill in the details you need? Again, yeah, you know, it always depends on the book. Um, I try to stay away from books that would require too much research because I'm such a, like, I feel like, personally speaking, I feel like story um, can be restricted by fact. So I get a little nervous whenever I think about writing like a historical book, for example, because the perfect plot line or the perfect character arc might be a little hindered um, if it's like, well, that didn't actually happen. So I'm sure there are a lot of people who write historical stories or anything that would require more research that would be able to say it actually helps me with my creativity and it's more freeing for their specific reasons. But for me, it's um, very the opposite and I feel very kind of like limited by it. So um, I think that that's why I tend to, if I write a book like for King and the Dragonflies, for example, um, very little research where I kind of, you know, I use information I already have about Louisiana. If I already, I tend to write 
books based in places where I already know them, know the areas and know the settings. And then for any more research that's necessary, very, very limited, because I don't want the um, story to feel too constricted. I feel like that's almost the um, age-old advice young writers often hear, write what you know, right? Like start with things that feel close and familiar and accessible to you as your starting point. Mm -hmm. um, that's This has been great, Case, and thank you so much for joining us today. And for the Book Up students who are tuning in, I hope you guys can join us again for our next visit, which is April 21st with um, National Book Award finalist Jarrett Krasowska. Um, for those of you who are interested in graphic works and art, this is a the book we'll be focusing on, Hey Kiddo, is a graphic memoir that Jarrett both wrote and illustrated. So for folks with an interest in art, this is definitely one that you don't want to miss. Um, but thank you again so much, Kaysen, and uh, I hope everyone has a great rest of your evening. Thank you, everyone. Bye.